This is Anglia, and now we join ITM. The IRA says it thought the army wife it murdered was a soldier. Her father-in-law calls it the lowest form of cowardice. Top Scottish Tory quits after allegations about his private life. As the fans return, the FA call off England's friendly with Holland. And a shock for Gower and Botham, they're out of the England squad. Good evening. The IRA say they murdered the wife of a British serviceman in West Germany last night. They say they thought she was a soldier. 26-year-old Heidi Hazel was shot dead at close range as she sat alone in her car. She lived with her staff sergeant husband in the Dortmund suburb of Unermessen. An IRA statement said the woman killed was believed to have been a member of the British Crown Forces. It went on, the outcome reinforces a warning we gave for civilians to stay well clear of British military personnel. There was no expression of regret. The Army said it was not possible to mistake Mrs Hazel for one of the women soldiers who live in a separate area of Dortmund. Tonight, servicemen's families are being given new warnings on security. The killer struck as Mrs. Heidi Hazel, who was German-born, drove into a shopping centre car park just yards from her home in this quiet suburb of Dortmund. He simply walked up to Mrs. Hazel's car and fired at least 14 high-velocity bullets into it. West German police believe the gunman, who was thought to have been wearing army battle fatigues, had at least one and possibly two accomplices waiting in a dark car nearby to drive him away from the scene. The police think the killer, in a familiar type of British Army uniform, was able to walk right up to Mrs. Hazel as she sat in the Saab in a quiet street. She was apparently manoeuvring the car when he fired, and it rolled backwards into a wall. The Army say the gunman, as he fired his Kalashnikov rifle, must clearly have seen in the good street light that his victim was a woman in civilian clothes. Mrs. Hazel Saab had British registration plates, making it an easy target for the terrorists. This morning, her husband, a staff sergeant who was away on an army exercise last night, was being comforted by friends as a police forensic team continued to search the surrounding area for further clues. Local people have been laying flowers on the spot where Heidi Hazel died. They're both angry and bewildered by her death. We are talking about Europe. What is this? Europe can never start if it goes on like this, can it? The army has stepped up security, especially in the married quarters, where soldiers and their families live unguarded among the general population. But the army recognizes the fear that this killing has generated among army families. They have supported their husbands valiantly over many years against this terrorist threat. Uh, and I'm sure they will have the strength of character to continue to do so. And they will get all the support that I can give them. The army is assuring its soldiers and their families that everything possible is being done to protect them. Security is being stepped up, and there's little talk here of rehousing them in guarded barracks. That, it's felt, could be interpreted as a victory for terrorism. Glenno Glaser, News at 10, Unamessen, West Germany. Heidi Hazel met her husband Clive when he was serving on the Rhine. They were married two years ago in Clive's hometown of Kilton in Nottinghamshire, where his father talked tonight about the closeness of the family. She's a wonderful lady, very pleasant, very loving. She was, uh, she was wonderful. And Hazel's father-in-law said he totally rejected IRA claims that the shooting was a mistake. What do you think about the people who did this? The lowest form of cowardice. Mrs Thatcher was among political leaders outraged and concerned about the threat to other army wives on the continent. It is very difficult to give, indeed it's impossible to give 100% defence. Uh, and we must just do everything we can to try to catch those who pursue this cowardly deeds against innocent and defenceless people. Obviously it's the work of psychopaths, people who don't even kill for a purpose or a cause but in order to satisfy their bloodlust, the sooner they're caught and punished, the better. I couldn't recall in all my time in Northern Ireland 
actually a killing as depraved as this one, uh, in, in the sense of walking up to a, an unarmed young woman uh, and just shooting her down in cold blood. And I think it shows the depths to which the provisionals have now sunk. This was the 23rd attack on British military targets on the continent in the past 10 years. Seven people have been killed and at least 43 injured. Bombs have been planted at six bases in West Germany and in an attack on RAF men in Holland. There were shootings inside West Germany and in Holland and Belgium. And in Munster last week, a machine gun attack on two off-duty soldiers, the latest in a series of attacks outside army bases. Investigators in West Germany say that the same IRA men carried out both the Munster and last night's attack, increasing concern about the future activities of a gang who are prepared to kill civilians. The Federation of Army Wives says it hopes there'll now be better security measures for army families. They mentioned in particular the secure garaging of cars to help prevent bomb attacks. But army wives have again made it clear they don't want to live in what they call security ghettos. This is the soft target IRA gunmen have in their sights. British military families living outside barracks on German housing estates. This fourth attack in Germany sets a pattern. The British are being systematically ambushed off duty by IRA hit squads despite tight security. Keep away from quiet, dark areas, especially at night. On TV, British forces broadcasting told families to take extra precautions. A frightened British soldier's wife explained her routine. Awkward, like when you go out shopping, you have to check your car before you get into it. And then you get your children, and you check again before you put the children in. And then when you come out of the shop, loaded with shopping, you have to put it all down, put your children down, then check your car again. Mind you, I don't mind doing that. It's better than getting blown up. The army won't discuss security arrangements, but there are regular patrols in these estates. A British soldier who also didn't want to be identified explained the fears. Uh, well, what can you say? I, I feel safe. I've always felt safe. But uh, the army do as much as they can. We do what we can to help, and uh, Terry sometimes always one step in front of us. Despite the recent IRA attacks, British car number plates are still a giveaway here. There's so many British plates in an area like this. I mean, it's so easy to say, to tell that you are a soldier. I mean, the short haircut gives it away. For local Germans, this IRA attack on a German wife of a British soldier is particularly shocking. Was denken Sie aus das uh, IRA? <laughs> da kann man keine Worte für finden. Das sind, das sind keine Menschen. This German woman said, I can't find words to describe the IRA. They're not human. At the local barracks, single soldiers live behind a high security fence that's being reinforced with concrete. But beyond the base, the safety of British families rests with passing patrols and on their own vigilance. Ian Glover James, News at 10 in Dortmund, West Germany. At least one soldier from the Ulster Defence Regiment is among a group of men being questioned in Northern Ireland tonight about terrorist crimes, including the murder of a Roman Catholic. The arrests follow the shooting two weeks ago of Mr Lochlan McGinn at his home in County Down. Loyalists claim they targeted Mr McGinn because of leaked information from the security forces. The president of the Scottish Conservative Party, Professor Ross Harper, resigned tonight after allegations about his private life appeared in the Sun newspaper. He said he was stepping down to save the Tory party any embarrassment. Professor Harper was a president who promised to wake up the party in Scotland, a high flyer not afraid of the occasional platform stunt. The party is running a poor third in Scotland with just 16% of the vote, and his job was to put new life into the grassroots where morale is low. He was a key figure in the drive to restore party fortunes north of the border. But as Mrs Thatcher began a visit to Scotland this week aimed at building up that support came the allegations about the private life of Professor Harper published in the Sun newspaper. The story couldn't have been published at a worse time for party leaders, though the official line is this is a private matter and nothing to do with the party. The allegations came from this 29-year-old woman and involved meetings in an Edinburgh hotel. Tonight, Professor Harper issued a statement from his Edinburgh home announcing his resignation as president. He said, I have taken this step only because I am determined that the Conservative Party should not be damaged or embarrassed as a result of recent publicity. He wouldn't expand on that statement and left the House soon afterwards. 
The announcement will dismay Mrs Thatcher, who completed her tour of Scotland today. It's the last kind of news she needed as she tries to put into effect her promise to paint the map of Scotland blue. She'll fear most of all the impact on party morale. 55 people are feared dead tonight after a Norwegian airliner crashed into the sea north of Denmark. The twin propeller plane, built in 1953, was operated by the Norwegian-based Partner. It was en route from Oslo to Hamburg when it went down off the Jutland Peninsula. Rescue workers, whose operation is being coordinated on shore 20 miles from the crash scene, say there is no sign of any survivors. So far, 32 bodies have been recovered from the sea. Most of the dead are thought to have been staff from a Norwegian shipping company travelling to the launch of a new vessel. The Football Association has called off England's friendly game against Holland in Rotterdam in December. The sports minister, Mr Colin Moynihan, wanted the game cancelled after trouble in Stockholm on Wednesday. Some of the fans returning from Sweden today said they are planning to travel to Poland next month for England's final World Cup qualifier. Tickets for that game are already available in Britain. The decision to pull out of the Holland match came as England supporters began arriving back from Sweden, hiding as best they could from the media attention which now focuses on their every move abroad. The football association say they had little choice, faced with intense pressure from the government. The Holland game was a friendly, and in the present circumstances, um, sad as it is, we don't see any point in taking risks that we don't have to take. It wasn't just the violence in Stockholm which brought opposition to the match in Holland. The Dutch have their own problems with soccer hooligans, and a clash was always likely between two of Europe's most notorious sets of fans. But England supporters say the FA has only itself to blame. I think to many people it's going to look as if the administration of the game has been handed over to the worst elements of the football hooligan crowd. Um, the FA now are picking up the tab for inaction over the years for ways of developing proper organised travel to internationals abroad. Many of the fans returning today were also looking for someone to blame. The media was one target. You're the worst ones in the lot, you are. Why? Because you are, you fucking love it. There were also complaints about the police who searched every fan before allowing them on board the cross-channel ferries and segregated them from other passengers. I don't want to know, you know. It's, it's embarrassing, anyway. It's the first time I've been abroad in my life. What, what do you think of abroad? It's all right, apart from the hassle. But despite it all, many fans say they are now planning their next trip to watch England play Poland. And in London today, ITN found out how easy it is to get tickets for a match from which English supporters are supposed to be barred. Poland's tourist office are selling them as part of a £280 package. But after complaints from the Football Association, they now say they'll look more closely at who takes up the offer. GEC and Siemens have won the £2 billion battle to take over their electronics rival Plessy. The consortium announced tonight that it has now acquired 62% of the shares. It's a personal triumph for GEC's chief executive, Lord Weinstock, who's been keen to take over Plessy since 1985. Tonight, GEC boss Lord Weinstock was putting the finishing touches to his victory in one of Britain's longest-running takeover sagas. Earlier, he and GEC chairman, Lord Pryor, had got the thumbs up for the bid from GEC shareholders. By four o'clock, they'd snapped up enough shares to finally win control of Plessy. Later, Lord Weinstock had a message for Plessy's directors who'd resisted the takeover bid. We I can understand if you feel down that um, you've fought very hard to prevent this happening. And now that it's happened, it must be inevitably depressing. And I'm, I'm sorry you should feel like that. I'm even more sorry that we had to go through this process of struggle before we arrived here, but that's how it is. In December 1985, GEC bid £1.2 billion for Plessy. This was blocked by the Monopolies Commission. In November 1988, GEC, with Siemens of West Germany, mounted a joint bid for Plessy. In January this year, Plessy was involved in a counterbid for GEC, which failed. By August, the £2 billion GEC Siemens bid was fully cleared by the government. It was hotly contested by Plessy, but today GEC Siemens announced they'd won control. The Plessy breakup follows complex negotiations with the Ministry of Defence. After the takeover, Siemens will get Plessy's radar and military communications divisions, including the Ptarmigan battlefield telephone system, while GEC takes the naval and aviation divisions. Away from defence, both companies will cooperate in joint ventures in both civilian telephones as well as microelectronics. 
GEC now has a stronger presence in the world electronics market. But tonight, Labour was demanding assurances for Plessy's 33,000 workers. I think it's essential for our industrial future that this time a takeover is followed by investment and expansion rather than asset stripping and retrenchment. One byproduct of today's deal, Britain's soldiers may find that some of their communications equipment is made in West Germany. Anti-apartheid leaders in South Africa now say police killed 29 people on election day this week. Families of those who died have described what happened, a report in part two. David Gower tells of his shock at being left out of England's winter touring party. And Linford Christie gives Britain a flying start at the World Cup in Barcelona. That's in a couple of minutes. Anti-apartheid leaders in South Africa now say 29 black people were killed by the police during protests over this week's elections. Church leaders held a press conference today to produce witnesses who backed their claims. But the Pretoria government has described their accusations as lies. Terry Lloyd's report has been compiled under South African government restrictions. Organisers of the news conference said they'd asked some of the bereaved to attend to repeat their harrowing accounts of how they watched as riot police shot their husbands and children. Others who'd been wounded on election night hobbled onto the stage. Black community leaders now claim 29 people were killed and 200 were injured. Archbishop Tutu said the families had reluctantly agreed to air their grief publicly to confirm their accusations against the police. I wish this was just a nightmare and somebody would wake me up and tell me it has not happened, it's not true. Then they told their stories, saying that children as young as three years old had been killed. This woman said she watched as her 16-year-old daughter was shot dead. The policeman just walked right up to her, stood in front of her and shot her dead, point blank. And she was five months pregnant. She was five months pregnant. But as the arguments continued over the precise death toll, a government spokesman insisted that no more than five people died in clashes involving police. It's difficult to say at this stage who killed who of the five, but certainly we have no evidence whatsoever that anything near 23 people even died, never, never even to say that they were killed by the South African police. Meanwhile, a church service to pray for the dead was held today. Next week, ironically, when Mr. de Klerk, the president-elect, will be in Cape Town for the state opening of Parliament, has been designated a week of mourning. It will culminate with the funerals for most of those who were killed. Terry Lloyd, News at 10, Cape Town. Mrs. Sunny Mann, the British woman whose husband Jackie was kidnapped in Beirut, is being urged by her family to return to Britain. Mrs. Mann said on last night's News at 10 that she'd been told by a contact that her husband was now dead. Today she pleaded for more information about his fate. In Beirut today, Mrs. Mann was unable to provide any more information about who or even why she was told her husband had died. Tormented by the news, she still doesn't know whether to believe it, and today appealed to her mysterious contact for more information about the reported death. He has my phone number. How he got it, I don't know, but he's got it. So I'm hoping that perhaps he will ring me again. Her husband was abducted from the streets of West Beirut 119 days ago and was in poor health. Despite repeated appeals to leave Beirut, Mrs. Mann says she won't abandon him. I don't know what to believe. I, I don't believe, he, I won't believe he's dead until I have some definite proof of it. Meanwhile, her family in Britain are again begging her to leave Lebanon. Her answer has always been, until now of course, that she would not leave until something was resolved regarding Jackie. Maybe now it has been resolved and this might change things. She's never felt able to break away from her ties in Beirut, particularly her riding school. But alone in the city tonight, with only her pets as companions, it might at last be time to leave.
Brent Sadler reporting. The former American president, Ronald Reagan, is to have an operation this weekend to remove fluid from his brain. His spokesman said tonight the condition apparently stemmed from a riding accident in Mexico two months ago. Doctors described the operation as routine. Cricket David Gow and Ian Botham have been speaking about their disappointment at being dropped from the England touring party this winter. The selectors have called up four uncapped players to boost the batting and the pace attack against India and the West Indies. Botham said tonight he was sure he'd bounce back to prove the selectors wrong. They've dominated English cricket for a decade. Now suddenly it's a sad exit together. For Ian Botham, it's been a summer when little has gone right. Mediocre performances with bat and ball. In the opinion of Ted Dexter and his committee, he's simply no longer worth his place. Ian sadly has just not shown international form. Uh, we would love to have picked him, but the performances just weren't there. With 5,000 test runs and nearly 400 wickets, Botham's match-winning feats are legendary, but now it seems it's the end of an era. He was very upset, extremely upset, as you would expect him to be. But the real shock is the discarding of Gower. Four months ago, he was Dexter's golden boy. Now he's not only been stripped of the captaincy, but he's also been told he's not wanted as a player. He, too, had a disappointing season, but after 106 tests and more than 7,000 runs, it's a devastating blow. I hadn't anticipated it, um, and I had, you know, despite, shall we say, yesterday's news, was gearing myself up to sort of the programme I had in, in mind, I as sort of rehabilitation, fitness, the rest of it, and to go out to the Caribbean, so it was a bit of a shock. New captain Gooch had no comment. He and Dexter clearly looking to a new blend of youth and experience. Into the squad comes Ricardo Elcock, a West Indian-born Middlesex pace bowler. He's 24 and has yet to make his test debut. Nasser Hussain, the Essex batsman, has been expecting a call-up this season. At 21, he's also a test novice. Keith Medlicott from Surrey made his name as a left-arm spinner. He's 24, he too has no test experience. Also from Surrey, Alex Stewart is a highly rated wicketkeeper middle-order batsman. He's 26 and also hasn't played test cricket. And Northamptonshire's Wayne Larkins gets recalled after a fine season with the bat. Aged 35, Larkins has played six tests before, the last eight years ago. He can withstand pace and pain, says Dexter. Snubbed by England, Botham's thoughts may now turn to South Africa, though tonight the Rebel Tour organisers claimed he wouldn't be approached at the moment. They also say the same about Gower. For him, a lonely end to a miserable summer. Soccer, just one result tonight in the Barclays League Division 4. Coaches to 1, Hereford 1. Britain's athletes made a good start to the World Cup in Barcelona tonight. Tom McKean won the 800 metres and torrential rain didn't hamper the team captain, Linford Christie, who won the 100 metres. With two days to go, Britain is joint second behind the United States. After their superb European Cup win over the Russians and East Germans, this British team came out in the pouring Barcelona rain with a real belief they could beat the rest of the world too. Their effort to achieve what would have seemed impossible a few months ago got off to a slightly disappointing start as Chris Akabusi in the middle could only manage third place in the 400 metres hurdles. The hero of Gateshead was beaten by the American Patrick and the Kenyan Amiki. But in the 800 metres, Tom McKean ran a brilliant tactical race timing his challenge till the very best moment, going past the Kenyan Kipritich on the last bend and just holding the East German Herald. Team captain Linford Christie's lifted this British squad and he ran a beautiful 100 metres, taking the American Burrell, the fastest man in the world this year, in his own powerful style. 10.1 was his best of the year and a superb example to the rest of the team. He obviously inspired young Steve Faulkner in the long jump. He came third. More efforts like this could see a remarkable result over the next two days. Jar Smith, IGN Sport. And the main points of the news again, there's been widespread condemnation of the IRA's killing of a staff sergeant's wife in West Germany. The IRA say they had warned civilians to stay away from army personnel. And the president of the Scottish Conservative Party, Professor Ross Harper, has resigned over allegations about his private life. And finally, some good news to end with. Scientists who've been monitoring the seal population in the waters around Britain say the virus epidemic, which wiped out half the seals in some areas, is over, at least for the time being. The latest figures released by scientists show the seal virus has killed far fewer animals than expected. 
Around the coast of Scotland, researchers have counted over 11,000 seals, the same number as last year. Either the virus has become much weaker or the seals have become immune. The picture isn't entirely rosy. Seals have been killed by the virus in some areas, despite the efforts of dedicated volunteers. The number of common seals around the east coast has been reduced by almost 50%, from 4,000 to 2,000. But the latest aerial surveys by scientists from the Sea Mammal Research Unit show that the position this year is much better than last autumn. It's looking quite hopeful. We've had very few reports of dead seals since the start of this year, only 150 compared with 3,000 last year. So as long as there isn't a sudden surge of deaths in the rest of this month, I think the chances of any large numbers dying now this year are fairly small. We can't be complacent. There is always a risk of a recurrence of this in the next few years. Although the epidemic seems to be over, seals are not safe just yet. Many of them have not been exposed to the virus and so haven't built up immunity. If the virus returns, seals born this year would be at its mercy. And that's it from us until next week. Have a very good weekend. Good night.